I certainly Sorry. want to uh, want to thank Brian for being here today to speak. So a little bit about us. Uh, I am the immediate past president of the Illinois Recycling Foundation, and Claire would love to have been here today to welcome everybody, but she's on vacation this week. So uh, she asked me if I would fill in, which was fine. Um, but uh, looking forward, you'll probably get to meet Claire in some future webinars. We have a very, very, very varied board with a lot of different interests uh, covering the gamut of recycling, not just the curbside materials, but also textiles and paint and uh, also um, construction demolition materials. Uh, so I do invite all of you to get to know our board members, if you can, to go to our website. If you're not a member, certainly I want to talk to you a little bit about why you should be a member. The Illinois Recycling Foundation's a 501c3 educational organization. We're dedicated to waste reduction, reuse, and recycling and supporting markets for recycled content materials. Members from a variety of disciplines come together to seek solutions to challenges that impact our mission. We express these concerns to state agencies and political leadership when necessary. We welcome members of industry, government, educational institutions, and nonprofits that share our goals. And you see, we also have a monthly newsletter, and we offer a variety of topics through education webinars, as well as a conference. We have been the collective voice of recycling in Illinois for over 40 years, and we have no fees for job postings, which we will also share on our social media when possible. Um, any of the employees or businesses or nonprofits or governments that join us, institutions are welcome to also attend our webinars and um, they get a discount on our in-person events. Uh, as I mentioned, the monthly emails, we cover a variety of topics, including if you have a press release that you're doing about something exciting, we'd love to share that in our newsletter when possible. Um, and we have a variety of activities, social as well as, um, as, well as over the internet here. And then our rates are extremely low. And as a member, you are also a member of the National Recycling Coalition, which has been around uh, for also, uh, I wanna say 50 years, if I'm not mistaken, quite a while it's been around. So just uh, we just held last month, our annual conference. Uh, we were in normal Illinois. Um, we had 15 sessions. It was a three day event. There were several tour options. And we had dinner and um, lunch, uh, lots of in-person things. So if you missed out on that, we'll be doing another one next summer. And as I said, we might have a tour or something like that. So it doesn't always have to be in virtual reality here. We do ask that everybody please mute themselves if you haven't already. Introduce yourself in the chat. If you have any specific questions, for OSHA, for Brian, please be sure to put those in the chat. If there's something that comes up during the presentation, put that in the chat. And Sue, our executive director, will be happy to share a lot of the questions that come in during the presentation. Um, Brian may also answer them during his presentation. He has a lot of information to share with us. And so I'd like to introduce him. Brian Bothus is a safety and occupational health specialist with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in Peoria. He has worked for Caterpillar in the Environmental Health and Safety Department and as an industrial hygienist with OSHA. Brian is a 1988 graduate of Illinois State University, which is where we had the conference, and has a BS in environmental health. So with that, Brian, I'm going to give this over to you and I'll be muted. All right, let's move off of that slide for sure. Uh, like she mentioned, my name is Brian and I work with Federal OSHA. And my plan today is to talk to you very quickly about OSHA inspections, our emphasis areas, and some of the common violations that I was able to run a report on uh, to see what we've cited at uh, places with recycling in the interest. So we'll move on through that. Uh, kind of OSHA 101, uh, anytime an OSHA inspector uh, 
is out at a facility, uh, they come with either a complaint or a severe injury report, or that you were selected based on one of our national or local emphasis programs. And so at the very beginning, they're going to have an opening conference where they're going to ask to talk to highest ranked management official or whoever is available uh, and go through uh, some basic information about the company name, size of the company, uh, get some background information to make sure that we have the, the correct legal information about the place. Uh, and then we're gonna do what we're famous for is uh, a walk around or an inspection based on whatever those whatever reason why we were invited out there. After we're done, we have a closing conference. Uh, and then of course, the biggest difference between us and a lot of uh, uh, groups is that we issue uh, a citation and that citation commonly has a penalty on it. And of course, that's why we got the, uh, the, the four letter word of a bad name uh, is because our penalties are rather significant. Um, a single serious violation can be over $15,000, uh, depending on the size of the company and how much, uh, how, how dangerous the situation was. Uh, now that's not the end all. Each employer uh, can take advantage of an informal conference where we can work you know, to negotiate uh, corrective actions and a reduction in penalty. Uh, and, all employers also have the right to contest the citations. And so that's kind of the basics of, you know, the, the OSHA inspection process. So we'll move on to a couple of, uh, of different things. Uh, the main thing that OSHA inspectors are out there trying to determine is, is there an employer-employee relationship? Is that employee exposed to a serious hazard? Does employer have knowledge of that situation or condition? And is there a feasible way to fix this? The, the hazard or what we're seeing as, as a safety and health concern. And so that's what most of the ocean inspectors spend their time looking at. Um, if I was your safety and health person at, at your facility or within the corporation, I'd say, hey, we need to start with these issues right now. Um, because OSHA recently, in fact, in 2023, changed their policy uh, that we will issue instance by instance violation for any of these topics. Um, and so every time one of, say we uh, come up with a concern about a machine guarding uh, or a lockout concern, um, the bosses now will be asking each inspector, uh, sh sh would this case classify as an instance by instance violation? Meaning uh, say we run across 15 machines that don't have adequate guarding. Instead of issuing one violation for the machine guarding for all the machines, uh, we're looking at potentially issuing 15 different uh, citations, even though it may be the same standard or even the same type of machine. Or if it was related to, let's say, lockout, tagout, or respiratory protection, we may be looking at each person uh, that was not following uh, appropriate lockout of an energy source uh, or not wearing appropriate respiratory protection. Uh, so it's expanded uh, what we just talked about with the significant penalties uh, as a multiplier. So lockout, tagout, machine guarding, confined space entry, respiratory protection, fall hazards, trenching, and even record keeping um, are what the agency has put forth that, hey, they want their inspectors to be looking, should we be doing an instance by instance violation for those violations? So we'll move. Uh, one of the most basic things is we want to make sure that every employer knows that there's an expectation for them to report fatalities within eight hours uh, to the agency. You can call 1-800-321-OSHA anytime, day or night, and there's somebody uh, who will take that message and get it to the appropriate OSHA office. Uh, we also expect that within 24 hours, the employers report inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, or any loss of eye. Uh, so uh, you want to make sure that you can either go to the OSHA website and report that information or that you can uh, with the, uh, you know, call that 1-800 number 321-OSHA. So next slide. Uh, on every OSHA inspection uh, for employers that are required to maintain an OSHA 300 log, that's gonna be one of the first things that the OSHA inspector says, hey, I'm gonna to need to look at that uh, during the inspection process. It may not be the first thing that they, they look at, but they're gonna let you know that we need to look at these. Uh, you, employers are required to maintain them uh, for at least five years. Uh, and then we'll go to the next slide, uh, which is the OSHA 300A, uh, an annual summary. And each OSHA inspector is going to be uh, taking that information down because it's an expectation that we have to put into uh, our, our basic inspection form. Uh, so we can kind of categorize, here's the, 
not only the types of injuries that the employer has been having, um, but if you will, a little bit to the severity of those sorts of injuries. So we'll keep going. Uh, if you have more than 250 employers, you're actually required to submit that 300A by March 2nd each year. If you're an establishment that has more than 20 employees in a high risk industry, uh, then you would also be required to submit that 300A data. And then starting in 2024, uh, a, a smaller subset of those high risk industries. Uh, if you're an employer with 100 or more in certain high risk industries, uh, then you're also required to submit not only your 300A, the annual summary, uh, but the actual 300 form and uh, the specific case data. So in the state of Illinois, it might be information off your Illinois Form 45 uh, or an equivalent to what OSHA refers to as the OSHA 301. Uh, also in those submissions, you need to make sure you include the legal name of the company, not what you, you know, call the facility. So if you call the facility, oh, our Southeast facility, uh, you're still required to include the legal company name in the submission. So we'll go ahead and go. Uh, and, and so uh, as we look at, you know, how's an ocean inspector going to end up at your work site, typically the most common ways we're going to end out there is that we either got a complaint, uh, you called us about a severe injury report, um, and or uh, you came off of a list, and those lists are created from what we call national and regional emphasis programs. So we'll go into what some of those sorts of things are to give you an idea why we might be coming out to one of your facilities or the things we might be checking if we're out there for an inspection. So this is a list of 2023 national emphasis programs, and at the top of the list right now is HEAT. So even if we're out for some uh, other reason for the inspection, we get invited out uh, if you don't happen to be working in an air conditioned facility and uh, you know your employees are working in warm conditions, uh, we're certainly going to ask about, do you have an appropriate heat illness prevention program? Uh, of course, excavation hazards, potential amputation hazards, lead, silica, hexavalent, chrome exposures, those are all big issues for us. Uh, we have a new emphasis program on warehousing. Uh, combustible dust is still a, something that we look into regularly. Uh, COVID-19 is something that we're still uh, addressing and have a national emphasis program as it relates to employees who have to care for people who are, po you know, have uh, positive exposures to COVID-19. Uh, ship breaking, primary metals, and process safety management. So let's take a look at a couple of these that I expect that you're going to see in your industry. And so the first one we'll start off with is heat. Uh, one of those questions we're going to ask you is, do you have any sort of heat illness prevention program? Like as part of your safety and health program, do you address heat in any way? Um, and so we're looking for whatever kind of document you have to address, hey, here's how we handle heat in the workplace. So our next slide. Next, we'll be uh, making sure that you have a mechanism to check on employees. Obviously, uh, one of the things we want to make sure happens is that the employer is checking on employees to see if they have any signs or symptoms of exposure. And so uh, we want to make sure you have something like that in place. Next slide. Uh, the next, we want to make sure that your employees are aware of those signs and symptoms of heat-related illnesses. Uh, the example I put on their slide is for heat stroke. Um, but you want to make sure that all your employees would recognize those sorts of things if one, one of the people they're working with or near uh, start to have any of those signs or symptoms. Next slide. Uh, we want to make sure that in your written program and or your process, you have a mechanism to acclimatize new workers. Uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health uh, has an expectation that most workers would be able to be acclimatized within seven to 14 days, um, but it's certainly not going to happen on day one or two. And so we want to make sure that new workers uh, begin, you know, if you will, acclimatizing to the heat uh, slowly uh, so that we don't have uh, them having an ill effect. Uh, from those sorts of things. And we wanna make sure that's a part of your written safety and health program and or your heat program as it is. Next, does your company ensure the availability of medical personnel for advice and consultation on matters of occupational health prior to the commencement of work and develop a plan for prompt medical attention? Oh, by the way, I stole that one from the standard, uh, right? I didn't invent anything. I just stole the language you might see in an OSHA standard. Uh, from those sorts of stuff. And so you want to be able to say, 
yes to that. Uh, and so if you don't, you haven't developed a clear plan for prompt medical attention, uh, if you say, well, we'd probably just run them down to the prompt care. Uh, you wanna make sure that you've at least contacted the prompt care and see if they have a way of dealing with, with heat illnesses. Uh, maybe they'll tell you, oh, we don't have one of the ice, uh, the ability to do an ice bath or, or do the proper cooling. You need to make sure you're taking them directly to the hospital. Uh, to avoid the additional time. It's that kind of preparedness. We, we just want to make sure you're prepared for those sorts of things. Um, next slide. Uh, and this becomes the critical question. Are you confident your employees under, understand the expectations for your heat illness prevention program? Do they know the signs and symptoms of heat related illnesses? Uh, do, are they actually taking steps to prevent dehydration? And then, of course, will they make the right choices when it comes to contacting medical personnel? Uh, it's not enough just to say, well, we have cool water and we have some air conditioning. Uh, if somebody has ill effects from heat, um, two of our fatalities that we did, uh, in the one case, they put them into a, a truck, turned the air conditioning on and gave them some water. And the next one, they had uh, another event. Uh, they gave the person some water and had them sit under the shade tree. Uh, on the surface, those don't sound like the worst things that you've ever heard, probably. Um, but when they uh, when we interview the employees and they say, oh, yeah, the person was kind of stumbling around and they were incoherent. Um, the people at the work site didn't see that as a medical emergency. And unfortunately, both of those victims died. Uh, so it's critical to make sure your employees understand those sorts of things and will take the appropriate action uh, to prevent heat illnesses in the future. So we'll move on. Our next topic is amputation hazards. And so there's an awful lot of machinery out there that can cause amputations. Uh, first and foremost, we'd wanna make sure that they have appropriate guards on them. Um, but then I can promise you as part of those, those injuries or illnesses, as we're looking at that kind of stuff, uh, we're gonna also, besides just the machine guarding, we're gonna look at things like, does the company have an appropriate lockout program? So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, lots of times, uh, when the employees get, let's say, injured uh, by a piece of equipment, it's a non-routine task. They're doing something that's not necessarily part of the regular daily activities. And so we're invited out there to address, geez, how did this amputation occur and what needs to be in place to prevent it in the future? Uh, and we, what we want is for you to take that same approach. Uh, you can see in this one, it's a, a conveying system. It's rather high. Uh, conveying system in the recycling industry is one of those things we saw as a hot spot. Uh, and certainly you're gonna wanna make sure that you uh, have either appropriate machine guarding uh, and or controls in place to make sure that the employers have implemented appropriate lockout programs. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. The other th common things we run across, especially if you're you know, recycling, say some of the computer parts or, or stuff from the equipment, you can run into heavy metals, uh, whether it be lead, hexavalent chrome, or a variety of different pieces of equipment. Uh, and OSHA's process for all of these sorts of, let's say, air contaminants and or physical contaminants uh, is to at least do initial air monitoring so you can determine exactly what those air levels are. Uh, making sure you've developed an appropriate, if you will, safety and health program, which in the standard they refer to as a written compliance program that will address what personal protective equipment is needed. Do we need respiratory protection? If so, what does that entail? Making sure you have appropriate hygiene facilities uh, so that the employees aren't wearing, let's say, contaminated clothes home or in their vehicles uh, or even at lunchtime. Uh, while they're eating or drinking to make sure that there's appropriate cleaning for all those sorts of issues. Uh, for lead exposures in particular, uh, the standard actually requires uh, blood lead tests and a test called a zinc protoporphin test. Uh, both of those will give you an idea as to the amount of lead that's actually circulating around in your body or maintained perhaps even in the bones. And so it's those sorts of things we wanna make sure are in place. And then obviously we want employees to have a good understanding of their risks and how to protect themselves. And that's all part of the training we would expect to see in any of those sorts of programs. Um, and, and certainly if you're dealing with any of these sorts of, of issues, OSHA has uh, uh, some help sheets and or uh, some publications that will help walk you through these uh, on our website. Next slide. 
Uh, combustible dust is another big issue for us. Uh, we see this routinely in recycling facilities. Um, this one, because I had a better picture, is of wood dust, uh, but certainly there's a variety of metals and other, even plastics, uh, that can become combustible dust. Uh, and obviously, one of the first things we're looking at is the general housekeeping uh, at the facility. Uh, certainly, we also, uh, anytime we see an air collector, especially if it's inside, uh, we're looking at what kinds of protections are in place uh, and does it have any sort of deflagration. Uh, protection uh, so that we don't end up with an explosion and perhaps a building collapse. Uh, if you guys remember uh, back several years ago, uh, there was an Imperial Sugar uh, factory fire that, that killed several people. And basically the entire building exploded from the sugar dust. And we don't often you know, think of sugar as being explosive when we're making our cookies or whatever else, uh, but certainly it's, a, it's an issue and something we need to make sure we're prepared for. So let's keep going. Um, OSHA doesn't have a fancy standard on combustible dust. What we have is what's called the general duty clause, which says each employer shall provide a workplace free of recognizable hazards. So as I mentioned in the beginning, employees, uh, OSHA employees are looking at, is there an employee exposed to a serious hazard? Did the employer have knowledge of that, of that condition? And is there a feasible way to abate it or fix it? And the NFPA does a very nice job in some of their standards of talking about, here's exactly how you would prevent uh, explosions and include different protections. Uh, so it's laid out in those NFPA standards, effective and fe feasible controls. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so all those elements are in place. Lots of times we'll show that employees are exposed to a combustible dust hazard, uh, that the employer had knowledge of that situation, and then the feasible corrective actions. So what kinds of things has OSHA issued citations related to combustible dust? Well, it's things like this. The dust collectors are inside of the buildings and it doesn't have appropriate explosion protection or suppression systems. Uh, the duct work is not maintaining enough velocity. So we end up with a buildup of that combustible dust inside the duct work. Uh, we also have run into issues where they don't have appropriate grounding uh, in, the, in the duct work. And so uh, when you end up with those sorts of situations, you can uh, end up with static electricity that can actually ignite your combustible dust inside your systems uh, and cause those fires or explosions. And then of course, the use of compressed air, uh, typically around equipment that's not rated for that kind of uh, combustible dust or those sorts of atmospheres. And so those are the common things that we wanna make sure that somebody has taken a look at and put in safety and health controls to prevent. So we'll go to the next one. So that was some of our national emphasis programs. And then in the state of Illinois, and actually the, uh, the Midwest here, uh, which includes Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, and Michigan, uh, that's region five, the region I'm in, uh, we have what we call regional or local emphasis programs. And those are related to fall hazards, powered industrial vehicles, noise, grain handling, food manufacturing, tank cleaning, building high-rise renovation. Uh, wood pallet manufacturing, maritime, and federal agencies. So we'll talk about a few of these here. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, we are worried about all fall hazards, whether it's just a one-time short use of a ladder uh, to, hey, uh, our, our structure uh, has a place where, you know, a raised storage area uh, where people will climb up. Uh, we wanna make sure that the employer has put into place uh, good safety and health efforts. So let's take a look at what we need to see for your fall protection program. Uh, we'll start off with, have you even trained your employees? We wanna make sure that you've trained all your employees on how to recognize the potential fall hazards and what those procedures are that we want you to use to protect yourself. Uh, obviously, uh, if there's any you know, pieces of equipment they need to wear like a personal fall arrest system, uh, or they're gonna be attaching or, you know, uh, doing work uh, using any of these systems. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're inspected and appropriate for use and the employees clearly know how to use those sorts of things. Uh, so that'll be one of those things that we're, we're routinely looking at, whether it's uh, climbing up on a piece of equipment uh, or working on top of a, a building uh, to anything from putting up Christmas lights, even non-routine tasks to uh, something as straightforward as, hey, we're gonna be loading this product up onto this, uh, uh, vehicle, and we need a safe way of doing those sorts of things. Those are all the sorts of stuff we want to make sure you built into your safety and health program uh, with an appropriate control that's going to protect people from falling uh, any sort of significant distance. We'll go to the next one.
Powered industrial vehicles are a common issue. So fork trucks, uh, any sort of tugger equipment that you might be using in an industrial environment. Uh, we want to make sure that your employees initially are trained on the vehicle and any specific things they might need to know about the work site. We also want to make sure that there's an evaluation of their skill set in using that equipment safely. Uh, that evaluation is supposed to be done once every three years to verify that the employee still has that skill. Uh, we expect that you're doing daily checks of the equipment, uh, of the basic functional items, uh, to make sure it hasn't lost all the hydraulic fluid, to make sure it's still the brakes function. Uh, and if you ever do find a hazard or an issue, we want to make sure that it's removed from service. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, we also expect uh, that you're going to keep a record of the training that your employees go through. Uh, OSHA will routinely ask you for your training record. And what we're looking for on that training record is, of course, the person who received the training, when that training was completed, the date of their evaluation. So the last time that they went through that process where they were evaluated to make sure that they still had that safe skill set, and then the person who performed the training and evaluation. We expect all of that information to be included in the evidence of, hey, this person is, is adequately trained and has that understanding. All right, next slide. Uh, noise is one of those regional emphasis programs that we have. Uh, the OSHA's permissible exposure limit for noise is 90. Uh, OSHA also has a uh, action level at 85. And if your time-weighted averages come up above any of those limits, we expect the employer to implement controls. So let's go to the next slide. If the noise levels are above 90, first and foremost, we expect that you at least look or evaluate whether engineering controls can reduce those levels down. Uh, there's a variety of, of silencers and, and things that can be used to minimize noise levels. Uh, we expect that you have done, like we said, the full shift noise monitoring to actually measure how our employees, you know, what the levels are that the employees are exposed to. If employees are exposed above 85, uh, we expect, and you can't engineer it out to, to get them down below, we expect you to implement what's called a hearing conservation program, which will include audiometric testing. If you remember back probably in fifth grade where you had to take the noise test and punch the little button when um, you have the, the two muffs on uh, where you're hearing the little beeps, uh, that's an audiometric test. Uh, and what they're trying to measure is, you know, what is your ability to hear? And year over year, uh, as part of the hearing conservation program, they'll have you take that test to see if your hearing is deteriorating. And if it's deteriorating, we'll try to make attempts to determine why. Is it perhaps you don't have appropriate hearing protection on, you're not wearing it correctly, uh, and try to fix that so that it doesn't continue to degrade. Uh, and then also we want to make sure employees are trained on the hazards of noise. Um, but that's only uh, the noise requirements kick in if the employees are exposed above 85 decibels as a time-weighted average. So we'll go to the next one. Um, as you, if you can remember all the way back to one of those beginning slides, we said confined space is one of those emphasis areas where they look at instance by instance areas. And if I only had a few minutes to talk to you about confined space, uh, we actually have a tank cleaning uh, emphasis program. And that's a place where uh, you could be included in at least people in the recycling industry at times have tanks where they're gonna be cleaning them out at times. Uh, the first thing I teach everybody is we wanna make sure the oxygen level is 20.8. If the oxygen level is not normal oxygen, which is 20.8, then we want to make sure we figure out exactly why. What's displacing that oxygen? Um, lots of times we'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly. But even a change from 20.8 to 20.7, uh, that simple change could be a big deal. So let's go to the next slide. Um, if if you don't have a good carbon monoxide monitor as part of your four gas meter, uh, then it wouldn't be un unthinkable that that 20.8 going to 20.7 uh, could be a significant amount of carbon monoxide um, because we can't smell it uh, because we don't necessarily recognize it by, hey, I uh, see right away that there's carbon monoxide in there. Uh, it often comes from the incomplete combustion of engines. Uh, so if you have any sort of engine running, even if it's not the exhaust, but an engine running nearby, like in this case, uh, they had a blower hose hooked up to the truck's transmission, uh, and the employee was overcome by uh, carbon monoxide when he was cleaning out a, a, a semi-truck that had contained flour. Uh, so carbon monoxide is a huge issue. We want to make sure that they're monitoring for those that in any sort of confined space. 
We'll go to the next one. The other significant hazard for confined spaces is hydrogen sulfide. Um, again, you want to make sure your monitor has the ability to test for hydrogen sulfide. Uh, in May of 2019, a farmer had entered a 1500 gallon milk tank to clean it with his well water. And in the process of cleaning that out, uh, he was overcome and killed by hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so it's critical uh, to make sure that your monitor also has the ability to test for hydrogen sulfide. Uh, you wouldn't have thought that water um, would would be what poisoned him. Um, but in this case, uh, the well water had uh, a level of hydrogen sulfide in it uh, and unfortunately killed him. And without a monitor to recognize those sorts of things, uh, unfortunately, people pass. Uh, the next one. Uh, you, and just to give you one more example, it's not always that, you know, we we don't see it. In this particular case, uh, they're getting ready to put gas, uh, a grass seed on a football field. Uh, so they're going to be blowing it. You might have seen them doing this on the side of the road. They'll put out uh, grass seed, you know, on some road jobs to try to uh, do this faster. Uh, in this particular case, they were getting ready to put the, using a hydro seed truck, uh, to put a seed on a football field. Uh, the first employee went into the tank. A second employee came in to try to you know, pull him out, and both were asphyxiated. Uh, so it's not always, if you will, what we think of as toxic chemicals in these confined spaces. It's critical to recognize if we do have a confined space, do we have a good way of doing air monitoring? And then if you can see from this example, anytime you're going to go into a confined space, you want to make sure you have an appropriate rescue system ready to go and the ability to pull them out. If the first person said, hey, I'm going to need to go into this confined space, say they had done the air monitoring and it didn't show anything, but when they got in there, it went bad uh, or alarmed. Uh, if they'd had a good rescue, they would have been able to pull that person out uh, and hopefully save their life. Um, and certainly we wouldn't have had two people uh, end up with that result. And so it's critical for confined spaces to make sure you have air monitoring, preferably continuously, and a solid rescue plan that has the ability to immediately move the person out, whether it's something as uh, unfortunate as they happen to have a heart attack or uh, something related to the actual confined space entry. Next. So I did run a report to see what I could find out as far as, well, what has OSHA cited in the last year? And so last year is actually the 2022 uh, season for us. And so here's what it looked like. Uh, we issued, the most common violation was related to powered industrial vehicles. Next one was hazard communication program, which we'll talk about in a second. Lockout tagout, which I mentioned, but we'll go into a little more detail and also in a second. Machine guarding, respiratory protection, personal protective equipment, electrical hazards, ladder hazards, which you saw one in a picture already. Obviously, we don't want people standing on the top step, especially because it says right on the ladder, do not stand on, on the second to the top step, usually on a sticker right on it. Um, blocked exits, noise hazards, confined space, and fall hazards. So some of those things that we already talked about are exactly what we issued citations for in the recycling business industries. So hazard communication, we expect every employer has a written program that deals with the hazardous chemicals that employees might be working with. Uh, employees are supposed to be trained on those pictograms right there that you see off to the right. Uh, we expect you have a list of the hazardous chemicals in their workplace. We expect that the chemicals are labeled with the chemical identity and the appropriate hazard warning. We wanna make sure that you've obtained a safety data sheets for the different products that your employees might be using. We'll go to the next slide. Um, most employers do a very good job of at least sharing with their employees, hey, we have a hazard communication program. Uh, you know, here's where you'd get the safety data sheets. Here's where those sorts of things are. And so we have a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of violations related to the basic employee information, but let's go to the next slide. The most common violations are re actually related to the employee training section. So employees are supposed to be trained on how to detect the release of a hazardous chemical, whether it has a visual appearance or odor or, or what it is in the workplace. We wanna make sure that they're trained on the basic physical and health hazards of those chemicals in the workplace. We wanna make sure employees are told that what measures they should take to protect themselves if there is a release of the chemical. And of course, we wanna make sure that they're given the basic details uh, of the hazard communication program, like the safety data sheets. Uh, so if you're you know, using you know, any product, or let's say you're gonna be bringing in a new product uh, that you're gonna be using, even if it's something as simple as, oh, we got a new housekeeping group, 
uh, we are, we're going to go to this new cleaning uh, com company, and they're going to be bringing in a new cleaner. If your employees are able to smell that, that chemical, uh, that would be employee exposure, right? Can you smell the chemical? Yes, it smells like a citrus uh, sort of odor. Uh, and so as we, we look at that to see, well, what does it contain? Uh, and heaven forbid, uh, it's got a citrus odor, but it also has uh, some pretty uh, corrosive materials inside there. We expect that the employees be told uh, that, hey, uh, the physical hazards are, it could cause some skin burns or severe eye, eye burns if you actually have contact with it. Uh, and then if there's any inhalation hazards or stuff like that, you would share that basic information with them. And the safety data sheets now do a very good job of sharing that information. Um, but we don't always find that employers have done a good job of sharing that with all the employees. We want that sharing to happen before they have exposure, not after. So we'll move on. Uh, next, lockout tagout. I had mentioned this one, that this is gonna be one of those things that the ocean inspectors will check, especially if there is an amputation hazard. Uh, and what we're gonna start with is, does the employer have a general program for dealing with lockout of equipment? Uh, but then I can promise you, we're gonna drill down to the specific piece of equipment and look, has the employer identified all the energy sources? Have they identified whether there's electric, pneumatic, or hydraulic energy? Uh, what does it say in the procedure as far as how to isolate that piece of equipment? And I'll be honest, uh, the, the most important part is how does it, you know, as far as the procedure, how does the employee verify that there is no energy associated with it? Uh, one of our pet peeves is where I'll say, well, just hit the start button and see if it lights up or starts. Um, well, that's not going to be okay for us if that's the electrical energy or if oftentimes if it's the hydraulic energy. Uh, if you've just burned up the motor, uh, the electrical energy could still be there when you hit the start button, uh, but yet the motor doesn't start up because you burn it up. Uh, so it's critical to make sure that whatever method you're gonna use for testing, so for electrical, commonly we might see something like a tick tracer, or we might see something um, like a non-contact electrical tester uh, that will verify, oh, we, have, we don't have any electrical energy here, here's our proof. And then the same thing with uh, pneumatic or hydraulic, perhaps there's a gauge on it, will show that the, the pressure is no longer a significant hazard, or maybe, especially with hydraulics, uh, you may want to have a temperature gauge on there. Uh, the hydraulics might be 600 degrees. Uh, and if you're not measuring the temperature to know when it's now safe to, to work on the hydraulics, uh, the employees could be exposed to the significant hot oil uh, as they get in there and to work on different things. So it's critical to make sure that you have a good procedure, that you train your employees on what those expectations are. And then annually, there's an expectation that you find whether or not your employees are doing this correctly. Um, and so those are all important issues for lockout tag out. We'll move on. Uh, and electrical hazards, they're pretty straightforward most of the time. If we uh, have it, we'll simply interview the employees and say, um, do you plug stuff in here? Yep, I did oh, about two months ago, I plugged something in there. Did it look just like that? Yes, uh, you know, employees are within a couple of inches of 110 and 110 is enough to cause serious electrical injuries and death. Uh, and so it's those sorts of things we wanna make sure people recognize and address. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, as part of any flexible cords, uh, we wanna make sure that they're inspected before use on any shift. If they're found to be defective in any way that they're actually removed from service. We'll go to the next one. Uh, I believe it's a picture of, the, of a fan. So in Quincy, Illinois, this last, uh, um, well, a little over a year ago now, we actually did a fatality investigation where the employee was simply picking up the fan to move it uh, so it would be in a better location to blow on him during his work. Uh, the fan didn't have an appropriate grounding. That was one of the hazards associated with it. That's that third pin that comes from your, your outlet. And so then that grounding pin is really part of the safety device of the fan. Um, it didn't have that. And so the employee, when they went to move the fan, uh, there was a short uh, as it were, and it, the electrical energy transferred to that metal casing, if you will, the metal stand of the fan and shocked and killed the individual. Uh, so we know all the time it's critical that you're checking the electrical equipment and if you will, the safety features 
of that equipment. And if you ever find that it doesn't have those sorts of things, that you take the fan out of service until it's repaired, because unfortunately, uh, they can be lethal. We'll go to the next one. Uh, one of the best controls that you can put in as far as a fix is making sure that the stuff you are plugging in uh, that would be exposed to either wet or damp locations uh, or exposure to to different hazards uh, is plugged in through what's called a ground fault circuit interrupter, uh, often referred to as a GFCI. Uh, these things are basically a safety feature that will shut off before that point where you would be electrocuted. So uh, if that fan had been plugged into a GFCI, when they went to move it, the fan would have shut off, the GFCI would have triggered, and the employee still would have gotten shocked, but these shut off so fast and at a low enough level that it doesn't uh, get to that point where the employee would be get shocked and killed. And so uh, in as much as you could, you'd wanna have everything plugged into a GFCI if that's feasible. Next, personal protective equipment. Remember that was one of the common violations that we ran across. Uh, OSHA inspectors would typically ask you for your personal protective equipment hazard assessment. So something in writing that spells out, here's what personal protective equipment we're going to need for the different tasks. Uh, and of course, it's going to be comprehensive where it walks through. Here's when we need to wear eye protection, face protection, uh, foot protection, if that's necessary, uh, any sort of gloves. Uh, if they are going to be wearing gloves, you want to make sure, especially for chemical exposures, uh, you want to make sure how long before that material would penetrate the gloves. Uh, if it's a dust or metal, uh, you may have a, you know, until the glove goes bad. Um, but if it's a solvent, uh, like say a, a petroleum distillate or a cleaner of some sort, uh, there's going to be a permeation time or a time when it will, the glove will still look okay, uh, but the solvent's is able to penetrate through. Uh, and so it might be as short as six minutes. Uh, I once ran into that at a, at a paint company. The gloves looked real nice uh, and were in good shape, um, but they were degrading really fast and they were really only good for about six minutes uh, based on their exposure to the xylene. So we'll keep going. Uh, next one is, of course, making sure your employees are trained when personal protective equipment is necessary, what they need to wear, how to properly use it. Uh, and of course, any limitations, like we just mentioned with the gloves, hey, these gloves are going to be good for eight hours, but we don't want you using them all week or whatever it happens to be based on the breakthrough time of those gloves. Next slide. Respiratory protection, of course, it is kind of its own animal. Uh, if your employees are going to be exposed to, you know, respiratory conditions, first step would, of course, be identifying how bad is it? Uh, and that's part of what we'd want to see in your written program as far as any exposures uh, that you have found, how you decided uh, which respirator you were going to select, and want that to be based on just that, that sort of thing. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, as part of an employee using, uh, especially a, a, a negative a pressure like a cartridge pressure, uh, uh, a cartridge respirator or a negative pressure respirator like an N95, uh, we want to make sure that they go through a basic medical evaluation. Um, you can use Appendix C of the OSHA standard, which is 1910-134. Uh, you could have them go through a, a review by a physician or other licensed healthcare professional. Uh, but in some way or another, you want to be able to say that they've completed a medical evaluation, that it's okay for them to wear uh, a, a respirator while they're doing whatever work they might have. The next one uh, then is we want to make sure the employee goes through a fit test. There's two basic types of fit tests. Uh, there's a qualitative fit test where the employee will go through a, a variety of functional tests, uh, turning their head from side to side, up and down, bending over and touching your toes while they're being subjected to an exposure of a product. Uh, most of the time, uh, they'll either use saccharin or isoamyl acetate, it smells like bananas, uh, or, or some of the different products like that. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide. Or uh, you can also do this test, which is called a quantitative fit test, uh, with a computer that simply measures the amount of dust inside versus outside and will tell you whether or not this respirator is actually fitting the employee well enough or not. Next one. As far as the national office has sent out, one of the highest priorities is making sure that all employers see safety as a core value. Uh, we wanna, instead of just saying, oh, well, we're just trying to do some compliance um, by you know, putting safety in as a core value of one of those activities, 
Uh, we expect that you're going to see better employee involvement in the safety and health program, those activities, uh, and minimizing hazards. And then, of course, equity is a uh, certainly a big issue for this administration. And obviously, the OSHA protections apply equally to everybody. Um, we don't ask any questions related to that. We're just simply focused on the safety and health activities. So we'll go to the next slide. If you did want to, uh, you know, how do I keep track of what else going on at OSHA? Uh, obviously, we will tell you we have a very good website. All the information that I shared with you today, I stole basically from our website in one form or another. Uh, you have a couple of handouts that'll take you right to the websites for either publications or the specifics for some of those emphasis programs if they're important to you. And then OSHA also puts out a, a bi-weekly newsletter on the 1st and 15th of the month. Uh, you can sign up to get a newsletter from OSHA. It's called Quick Takes. Uh, and they share information about what's new or some of the things going on uh, as far as safety and health. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this was... If you are a small business in the state of Illinois, you can take advantage of what they call the Illinois On-Site Consultation Service. Uh, that's where an employee who's trained as a, uh, same as our OSHA inspectors, uh, will come out and help walk you through or help identify hazards or issues or improvements uh, to your safety and health program. Uh, and you can either call their 1-800 number or you can sign up through their website. Uh, small employer in the state of Illinois is generally 300 employees or less. Uh, so that's certainly an option. And each state has that. And one of the handouts actually has the contact information for each state. Uh, you'll see that where it says on-site consultation and that booklet will take you to each state's on-site program. Next slide. Uh, is for questions. Uh, so that means we can go to the next slide. And, and I'll be honest, I was not watching the chat while I was talking. I was trying to you know, keep the flow going. Um, that's specifically my email address. So what I can offer you is uh, after this session, if you didn't want to ask something in the chat, uh, you have my direct email and that's also my direct phone number. Uh, so if you have something that you wanted to ask or discuss that you didn't want to do in front of the group, that's fine. Um, I'll be, I'll make myself available or get back to you on any questions or issues that you might have. Um, so I guess I, was there any questions in the chat? Cause I'll be honest, I wasn't watching oh. it. Actually, Brian, if I might interrupt. So one last commercial for the Illinois Recycling Foundation, uh, and then we'll open it all up to question and answers. I'm sure Sue's been keeping track of questions that came up in the chat. Uh, and I just want to invite anybody who is not currently a member to please become a member. We're very reasonable. We have at least one webinar planned already, which is our Illinois Professional Recycling Forum, but uh, we intend to have a couple of more coming up, possible tour, and so we're always looking for topics. If uh, any of you have anyone that uh, you'd like us to explore, um, please let us know. And uh, I'm going to turn it back open now. Uh, invite Sue here to let us know if there's some great questions in the chat. I know I have a couple, but we'll start with Sue. And then anybody who wants to can unmute and ask a question or throw it in the chat, whichever you're comfortable with right now. Thanks, Brian. Great job. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciated all that information as well. Um, Marta, there actually are no questions in the chat. So um, if you want to go. Well, I'll start with mine then and, and, uh, and steal some thunder from someone. But um, I guess my, my one question is we have a number of electronics uh, recyclers, refurbishers, and um, I know that some of them end up uh, either they, they take in willingly uh, television sets, or they get uh, gifted uh, unwillingly television sets. And if they're getting exposed to broken CRT glass, um, is there something that uh, OSHA recommends? Is there training uh, for that? Are there precautions that they should be taking with that? And is there a nice, easy spot to find that? I know you had a uh, nice, whole section on lead. <laughs> nice, easy spot, no. Um, but here's where you're going to start. We expect that the employer goes through and, and makes an evaluation of the hazards based on, let's say, how often that happens. If it happens once a year versus happening twice a day, there's going to be a difference there, right? So based on the you know, reasonably anticipated hazard, uh, you're going to select appropriate personal protective equipment and or procedures as to how you're going to handle that in the future. Uh, it could be that, hey, we just have a uh, you know, we throw on a, we're able to throw on a Tyvek suit, uh, we're able to wear gloves, and then we simply dispose of that in an appropriate way. 
uh, for those sorts of things. It's really dependent upon the employee exposure. Uh, and there's, so there's no easy way to categorize that for everybody across the way because every place is a little bit different. But by doing that initial evaluation, if, the, if you can show that based on our work practices, the exposures are below the permissible exposure limit or below the action level if it was for lead, uh, then it may be just using appropriate personal protective equipment to make sure that you're not contaminating your hands and then ingesting it, right? It could be something as simple as that. It's really gonna depend on that employee exposure. Uh, and so an easy place to start might be uh, when you know those sorts of things are going to occur or save it for a certain time. Uh, and you could have the on-site consultation come in and they can do air monitoring for you and help you with the, here's how you know what those levels are. Uh, so that's the critical part is really determining the exposure. And there's no easy, you know, initial answer for that except for, you know, testing it. Uh, determining what those levels are. And you can do a combination of wipe samples and air samples to make those determinations for your particular workplace. Thank you. Um, you also, in your slides, you mentioned high-risk industries, and that was uh, as low as 20 employees. What would be some of the high-risk industries? Uh, so especially anything that's reuse, recycling related or composting related. Um, so generally, we don't see it so much in composting, uh, but we do certainly see it in agricultural fields. Um, and so there's a list in the OSHA standard. What I would tell you is uh, make a determination as to what your North American industrial code is, and then you can go right to our website and see if we're on the list or not. Um, most manufacturing is, well, all manufacturing is in the, hey, if you have 20 or more employees, then you are required to send in your OSHA 300A data. Uh, there's that brand new list that'll be coming that's already out. Uh, and I can, I can email it or share it with the group as far as the, the new list for if you have over 100 employees. Uh, but it's really, those lists have been out for, the, the former list was been out for about three or four years now. And so, uh, but the key is knowing your North American industrial code. Um, and, and then you can just, check that. And if anybody has a question, like I said, you can send me a quick email and I can verify it for you if you need, if you're having trouble finding that. Then I have one last one and that is batteries. So um, battery fires for our regular curbside service MRFs for our electronic recyclers, there's all these embedded batteries and products. Is there anything um, safety related that we can talk about with um, these batteries that come in and cause problems? Uh, yes, you should, you should have a plan of action similar to the, uh, what we just talked about is, hey, we run into this situation. What is the plan of action for the employee to protect the employees uh, from that exposure? Uh, whether it be, like you said, a, a, you know, whether it's a battery fire or just a leaking battery. Right, the acids associated with that leaking battery can be a hazard physically. Uh, so, you know, in its simplest, you know, thought, how do we make sure that the employee is not going to, you know, have have fingertip burns from when they went to pick up the material? Uh, it could be as simple as that, and making sure you select the right personal protective equipment to as significant as we're not fighting these sorts of fires. We're going to evacuate, and here's our how we have appropriate, you know, fire protection either in that particular area or an appropriate response from the local fire department uh, and making sure that they're prepared to deal with the types of material that you might have coming in. Uh, and and it, it should be okay for, I mean, they, 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 most every fire department would be okay with dealing with the basic battery acid. But if you have, uh, you know, you're somehow reclaiming aluminum dust or some of these other products that they may not be prepared for or, or different products that you might not wanna be spraying water on, uh, that's important to to make sure that the fire local fire department has that preparation and or you have method to deal with it. I'm, does anyone else have questions? You can unmute and ask. We had a terrible battery fire several years back in Morris that uh, was related, I believe, to the way they were storing them. Okay. Um, well, while oh, we're they, waiting, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there is a question on here. 
Um, it's what are the best practices for dust collection cleanup at MRF as far as OSHA would like to see? Um, so we'll start with how do they do it now? <laughs> Uh, I can tell you what we don't want to see probably is compressed air, right? If it's a combustible dust, the last thing you want to do is, is take pneumatic air, blow it up into the area, uh, or using it to blow it out. Um, vac, you know, a HEPA vac, of course, is the preferred. If you have a, have a HEPA vac, that would always be, you know, a, a piece of equipment that's rated for combustible dust that's gotten outside of the areas. Uh, short of that, we'd prefer that, you know, they use as much engineering controls as possible. Uh, if you know you're going to have a dusty area, it'd be no different than if you're going to have, you know, a welder's hood, right? They have collectors for so that the welding fume doesn't go throughout the entire shop. They try to collect it uh, at the source, uh, contain it. Uh, the dust collector that you saw, if that dust collector was outside, we'd think differently as opposed to it being inside. Uh, we'd also, you know, want to make sure that it has an appropriate deflagration protection. So there'll be uh, places so that the, the whole um, mechanics, if you will, or the metal parts uh, don't explode, but there'll be a part that would relief. Uh, so if there was a overpressurization or a fire or, or the potential for risk for that, uh, it vents to a safe place outside where it wouldn't strike any employees. So there's those sorts of things that we would expect to see. Um, but as, you know, it just depends on the exact situation that you're you're looking at, and of course the quantity. When you say quantity, if I could, I've gone in lots of different facilities. Um, are, um, is there like a, a threshold of where there's too much dust? Yes, um, but it's not an easy. Oh, I can. Uh, generally, what we tell you is you start with housekeeping, right? If you can write. Uh, OSHA in the dust, we're going to say you probably have too much dust. You, you know, it's like you can <laughs> write it in the stuff. We're going to say, wait a second, there seems to be an accumulation here. So then we start at uh, what is the uh, what is the housekeeping practices? Uh, are they cleaning the are they cleaning up the area at a minimum every day? Do they need to be doing it more than once a day? Uh, those sorts of things. If they said, well, we do it at the end of the week. Uh, and there end up being, you know, several inches of combustible dust uh, in those sorts of areas, we're going to get uncomfortable uh, and think that there's a potential hazard, especially when there becomes an ignition source uh, other, or other energy uh, that could, you know, create a, a fire or an explosion. Any other Anything questions? Else? You're very thorough, Brian. I appreciate that. Great information. And uh, like I mentioned yesterday, if there's specific things that people have questions on, whether it be, hey, I'm struggling with this hazard communication program. I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Uh, feel free to reach out. We will gladly help you through those sorts of things. Um, obviously, there's uh, uh, we've already created and have a variety of whether it be a sample programs or some checklists that can help on all these sorts of things. I provided a few of them uh, with the handouts that you'll see. Um, but if there's something you're struggling with and, you're, and you need help, uh, by all means, reach out and we will try to help you through or get you the information that will hopefully be useful for you so you can improve your safety and health program. Thank you. I hope you're getting a chance to look at the chat there too, Brian. Um, got some compliments coming in so um but yeah i i really appreciate it i i don't want to let you go without giving everybody one last chance any any other questions you an excellent resource and i hope everybody's got a chance to take down your phone number and your email and as um sue said earlier we will you know we have recorded this and we will be putting it up on our youtube channel so you certainly can come back and take a look at it um, and the OSHA website for more information as well. Thank you all. Thank you.